Ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum. I extend a cordial welcome to all the distinguished participants and the audience present this morning. There is a saying that if you are certain that our faith rests on the sure foundation of reality, we must be content to understand that the failure of others to accept it in no way destroys the truth. Dr. Zakir Naik, who is going to speak on media and Muslims today, he is just 33 years old and he is the president of Islamic Research Foundation Bombay. Though a medical doctor by professional training, he has devoted himself to analyze Islam and other religions objectively and spread the real truth. He is an international orator on Islam and comparative religion par excellence. He is acclaimed widely for his logical, reasonable and scientific approach towards his subject. He is appreciated for his comparative knowledge of Hinduism, Judaism, Christianity and Islam, especially for the verbatim quotations from the religious scriptures. I call upon Dr. Zakir Naik to start his deliberations. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam. Wa ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sabi ajmain. Amma baad. Auz billahi minash shaitanir rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ikra. Bismi rabbika allazi khalaq. Khalaq al-insana min alaq. Ikra o rabbuka al-akram. Allazi allama bil kalam. Allama al-insana ma alam ya alam. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi shuhali sadri. Wa yassir li amri. Wa ahlul ugdata min lisani yafkahu kawli. The chairperson, Mr. Salih, my respected elders, and my brothers and sisters. I welcome all of you with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace, blessings, and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. The topic of this morning's talk is media and Muslims. Media is defined as the means for mass communication. And media can be classified under two categories, electronic media and non-electronic media, which can further be divided into periodical and non-periodical. First, let us analyze what is the non-electronic media. Non-electronic media is a media which consists of literature and written materials, mainly. It's divided into periodical and non-periodical. Non-periodical, non-electronic media is the literature the written works which are published, which occur, which appear on non-regular basis. For example, we have pamphlets, we have booklets, books, etc. The periodical non-electronic media is the literature or written works which come at regular intervals. It's published, it appears, it occurs at regular intervals. For example, the annual, biannual, or quarterly periodicals and magazines. We have monthly, fortnightly, weekly periodicals and magazines. And we also have the daily or the morning and evening newspapers. The electronic media, again, can be divided into periodical and non-periodical. The non-periodical, which consists of audio, it consists of video, it consists of computers, of internet, etc., which are further divided into various subheadings of periodical and non-periodical. In the audio, we have audio cassettes. We also have compact disc, audio compact disc. In the video, we have films, we have documentary programs, etc. And in the computer, we have diskettes, we have CD-ROMs, which consist of material. And in the periodical electronic media, we have bulletins, news, as well as regular programs, which consist of audio and video both, 
which comes and is relayed and broadcast on the radio, on the cable TV, on the television, on the satellite, as well as on internet. Today, scientific research has shown us that the retention power of different types of media that keeps on differing. When you read any material, on an average, the retention is 10%. When you hear something, the retention is 20%. When you only see something, that's visual aids, the retention is 30%. And when you hear and see simultaneously, that's on video or when you see a live talk or lecture, the retention is 50%. Our research has been done. Therefore, the best and the maximum retention that's there when any person spends time is when he utilizes all three of his senses besides seeing, hearing, and understanding. All three are utilized simultaneously. If you analyze amongst these medias, those which are non-periodical medias, their reach is limited. And the influence on the people is limited as compared to the periodical media. The non-periodical media like booklets, pamphlets, or maybe books, audio cassette, video cassette, they have a limited reach. Because when anyone publishes a book, he publishes in a quantity of maybe 1,000, maybe 2,000, maybe 5,000, maybe 10,000. Sometimes the book is more popular, it may go in larger numbers of 100,000 or maybe more. But normally it's in tens of thousands. It's limited. If you compare the periodical media, like what you hear on the radio, on the television, what you read in the newspapers, etc., this has a wider reach. As we know, the newspapers are published in tens of thousands. Several newspapers in hundreds of thousands, in lakhs. Some even in millions. And it's on a daily basis. And more shorter the interval, more regular the periodical, better is the impact, better is the influence on the mass. And the periodical media influences the mass on the day-to-day -day activity much better than the non-periodical media. The non-periodical media may talk about ideas and ideologies, but the regular day-to-day -day life is mainly influenced by the periodical media, like newspapers, like television, news, like satellites, etc., on the radio, etc. Therefore, for influencing the mass on a day-to-day -day basis, on a daily basis, on a regular intervals, the periodical media has a better impact. Previously, a few years ago or a few decades ago, the media which was maximum used for influencing the people was the newspaper on a day-to-day -day basis. Newspaper, mainly daily newspaper, sometimes even weekly. And now, the times have changed. Even the television, even the satellite, which gives daily news, influences the people on the regular day-to-day -day activities. But even today, where the local influence is concerned of that particular country, of that particular area, the newspaper is yet ahead. But where it comes to international influence, international influence, today, the satellite and the television media, they have taken the lead. They are far ahead than the newspaper media. The newspaper mainly influences today on the local level. There are international newspapers in various parts of the world, but the international influence is more by the satellite because satellite has spread throughout the world. And you have news on channels like BBC, CNN, every half an hour, every hour. The topic is media and Muslims. The word Islam comes from the root word salam, which means peace. It also means submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to Almighty God. In short, Islam means peace acquired by submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And any person who submits his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is called as a Muslim. And I started my talk by quoting a verse from the glorious Quran, from Surah Ikra or Surah Alaq. 
chapter number 96, verse number 1 to 5, he says, Ikra, bismi rabbik allazi khalaq. Khalaq al-insana min alaq. Ikra, wa rabbuk al-akram. Allazi allama bil kalam. Allama al-insana ma alam ya alam. Which means, read, recite, proclaim. In the name of thy Lord who created. Who created you from a congealed clot of blood. Something which clings, a leech-like substance. Read in the name of thy Lord who is bountiful. Who taught men the use of the pen. Who taught men that which he knew not. The first guidance given to the whole of humanity by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the glorious Quran was not to offer salah, was not to give zakat. It was ikra. It was read. The first guidance in the glorious Quran is ikra, read. But unfortunately, the majority of the Muslims, they say la ikra. We don't know how to read. And our beloved Prophet, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace be upon him, it's mentioned in the hadith of al-Bahaqi, that it is obligatory on every Muslim, man or woman, to acquire knowledge. It's compulsory that every Muslim, irrespective whether he's a male or a female, they should acquire knowledge. Knowledge and education has been given a very high status, a great deal of importance in the Islamic deen. But unfortunately, we find that most of us Muslims, we aren't following the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Surah Al Imran, chapter number three, verse number 110, he says, Kuntum khaira ummatan ukhrijat lin nas. O ye Muslims, ye are the best of people evolved for mankind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us Muslims an honor. You are the khaira ummah, the best of people. Now, whenever there is honor, it is always followed up with a responsibility. There is no honor without responsibility. For example, in a school, the principal has got more honor than a teacher. A teacher has got more honor than a clerk. Similarly, a principal has got more responsibility than a teacher. A teacher has got more responsibility than a clerk. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us Muslims, Kuntum khaira ummat nukhrijat lin nas, ye are the best of people evolved for mankind. Allah is giving us an honor. Don't you think we have a responsibility? The responsibility is said in the same verse. It continues. Because we enjoin what is good, and we forbid what is wrong, and we believe in Allah. We are the best of people evolved for mankind, because you enjoin what is good, and you forbid what is wrong, and you believe in Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us an honor that we are the best of people because we are supposed to enjoy what is good and forbid what is wrong and believe in Allah. If we do not enjoy what is good and if we do not forbid what is wrong, we are not fit to be called as khaira ummah. We are not fit to be called as Muslims. It is the duty of every Muslim that he should enjoy what is good and forbid what is wrong. That is do dawah and islah. It's compulsory. The moment he meets a non-Muslim, it's his duty to present Islam to him. And since today is the age of science and technology, where mass communication has reached very high levels, it's the duty of us Muslims that in order to be khaira ummah, we have to be the best in communication. In mass media, we should be number one. Allah calls us khaira ummah, because they're supposed to enjoy what is good, probably what is wrong. Today, the world is advancing in science and technology. If we have to be the Khaira Ummah today, we have to be number one in mass communication. But unfortunately, we aren't. We aren't. Unfortunately. It's the duty of every Muslim that he should do dawah. He should deliver the message of Islam, the message of Deen al-Haq. It's compulsory. But if we analyze, we are far from doing our duty what Allah has commanded us to do. And if we analyze how much work have we done in this media, we will come to know that we are in a pathetic condition. Let's analyze the non-electronic media. As I mentioned, in the non-electronic media, we have the non-periodicals, 
like booklets, books, and pamphlets. If we know that there are so few organizations which are involved in publishing literature, presenting the correct picture of Islam. Because today, if we see around us, Islam is in the firing line, in the newspaper, in literature, on the television, on the satellite, we are in the firing line. Very few Islamic organizations are involved in trying to present the picture of Islam to the world. Very few, very few. On the other hand, we have the Christian missionaries. They publish pamphlets. They not only present their picture, they try and even malign Islam to the maximum level. Today, the Western world is afraid only of Islam and nothing else. Only of Islam. And you find there are pamphlets given out. Besides trying to promote their faith, the Christians trying to promote their Christianity, they even have pamphlets which are actually trying to undermine Islam. And when you go to these countries, these missionaries, they go to countries like Pakistan, Muslim countries, they attract the Muslim masses and they distribute beautiful four color leaflets and four color posters, small cards, pocket cards. And some samples we have in a foundation, Islam Research Foundation. And if you read that small pocket card, it will say, Allah Muhammad. Peace be upon him. And any Muslim would kiss it and keep it in his pocket. If it's a big poster, he will take it and put it on his wall. Allah Muhammad. Peace be upon him. But if you analyze closely, it's not Allah Muhammad, it is Allah Muhabba. God is love. Allah Muhabba. God is love. It's actually a quotation they pick up from the Bible and they write it in the Arabic calligraphy. I don't know, we have posters of dua, etc. So one such beautiful poster, beautiful color, four color job, Rabbana, Rabbana, and then you say, oh, Rabbana, then automatically in the front will come, Atina, Fit Dunya, Hasnato, Fil Akhirat. You know, it's, it's mechanical. The moment you read Rabbana, so you think, oh, it's a dua. Four color job, beautiful. When I saw it the first time, I thought, oh, the Muslim world is advancing. Alhamdulillah, Muslim world is advancing. Beautiful. And when you ask a person, even who knows Arabic, he may be an ulama, he may be an Arab, born Arab. Even he will read, Allah Muhammad, or he may read, Rabbana Atina. But if you analyze closely, it is Abbana, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, in Arabic. In Arabic. Abbana. You know, they write in such a way that it can easily be mistaken for Abbana, Atina. And Muslims keep it in the drawing room and they distribute free of charge. And if we happen to sell this also, suppose if you go for Hajj, and in Hajj if you sell for one one real, 99% will buy, 99.9% .9 will buy it. It's a snake in the house. It's a snake in the house. Any Arabic thing we see, we think it's the kalam of Allah Ta'ala, we kiss it and keep it. We should not cause disrespect to it. They are in the field. We should not use these techniques. These are deceitful techniques. Quran says in Surah Isra chapter 17 verse 81, وَقُلْ جَا الْحَقُ وَزَاقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوكَ When truth is heard like in falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. We don't have to use the deceitful techniques, but we have to understand that these people, they are using technology, they are using media, not only to propagate their faith, even to undermine Islam, to malign Islam, to catch fish. Do you know, in the span of last 150 years, there were 60,000 books written against Islam and our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 60,000. In the last 150 years, 60,000 books were written against Islam and our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We, I doubt if Muslims have written so many books in English language to promote Islam, I doubt. It's a shame on us. We are far behind. And do you know that the Bible, which is supposed to be the holy scripture of the Christian, of the Western world, do you know that according to last year's statistics, they have translated the Bible into 2,032 different languages. 2,032 different languages. That was 
the status more than one to one and a half year back. Now I don't know what's the latest. 2,032 different languages. Do you know how many languages the Holy Quran has been translated in? Do you know? Can anyone guess? Can anyone guess? How many languages? How many? Can anyone guess? No one can guess also. It's a shame. We don't even know. Leave aside, we have translated. We don't even know. Muslims don't even know how many languages our glorious Quran, the Kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been translated in. Hardly 100 languages, maybe little more than 100 languages. Only. And the Christian missionaries, they say that even after translating the Bible into 2,032 different languages, yet they only reach 80% of the world. Only 80%. Now imagine with 100 languages, how much percentage of the world are we reaching? 100 means hardly 5% of 2,000. It's a shame on us. Little bit more than 100. That's also recently. A few decades earlier, it was negligible. It's recently in the past few years that we have translated various languages. And the Christian missionaries, do you know, only in Arabic, they have translated the Bible in 11 different dialects. Different for the Egyptian, different for the Saudi. 11 different dialects in Arabic alone, catching fish. 11 different dialects. In Arabic alone. I mean, different, different. Because Arabic is one, but different, different styles is there. We have not even translated the Quran. Very few, recently. The English translation also came just recently. The first English translation was done by a non-Muslim. Maligning Islam in Latin. Then by George Sale. Translated from there. And then we Muslims woke up, oh, they are maligning Islam, and then we make an effort. It's a shame on us. If you analyze the periodical, non-electronic media, talking about annual periodicals, biannually, quarterly, or monthly, how many international Islamic magazines do we have? How many? How many? Yes, we know of Muslim World League, Impact International, Juma. I doubt whether any of you may have heard. Few may have heard about this. Majority may not have heard. It's unknown. Only those who are in the field. But there are very few. Very few. But even these magazines that are there, it mainly goes to the Muslims. If you analyze the Christian missionary plain truth, have you heard about plain truth? Who hasn't heard about plain truth? Raise up your hand. Who hasn't heard of the magazine plain truth? Plain truth, plain truth. One, two, three, four, five, maybe ten. Five I could remember. Ten. Only ten people did not hear about plain truth. That means more than 90% of the audience know about plain truth. Plain truth. How many heard about the Juma magazine? It's the Islamic magazine. One, two. How many people heard about the Impact International? Supposed to be very good. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yet, it's a shame. See, the international magazines of Muslim Ummah supposed to be the best. Horizon, Muslim World League, maximum circulation. Less than 5% of the Muslims know. And the non-Muslim plain truth, which is distributed free of charge in millions of copies, less than 5% don't know. This is the situation. It's a shame on us. You know, plain truth, they give free, free, millions of copies. It's a missionary magazine. And the more articles that they take out with expertise, they have the best of writers there. The best quality of paper you find. Four color job. And besides this, plain truth goes to more non-Christian than Christians. The Muslim magazine go more to Muslim than very few non-Muslims. Majority complementary are also. And if you analyze, even in the local magazines, we have several local magazines, and even in India, the best that I know of, which has the maximum circulation, is Islamic Voice. There are also hardly 15,000. And the person, Sadatullah Khan Saab, Brother Sadatullah Khan, he's a close friend of mine. He's from Bangalore. He's doing a wonderful job. Wonderful job. May Allah give him jazai care. But yet, compared to the Western world, nowhere. It's one of the best monthly newspaper, or magazine you want to call it. It has a maximum circulation. The others which are running for 10 years, 20 years, 5,000, 6,000, some 2,000, some 1,000. Shame on us. 20 years we're operating. Nothing. No results. 
and majority of these papers also go to Muslims, Muslims, Muslims. At least Islamic wise, I'm told that more than 3,000 go to non-Muslims, alhamdulillah. But even in these Islamic magazines that we have, it only gives a picture of Islam, which is important. But if you see the magazines run by Christian missionaries, they, besides promoting Christianity, they do in a subtle way, they even give you day-to-day -day knowledge. So even if you're not interested in Christianity, you will take the magazine to know what's happening in the world. And then indirectly, you are being inoculated with the message. You know Time magazine? Who doesn't know Time magazine out here? See, everyone knows. Newsweek, who doesn't know? Everyone knows, 100%. 100%. Time magazine is a weekly magazine, supposed to be neutral, supposed to be. Supposed to be neutral and supposed to be unbiased. But you can see the material that's there. It's bombarding the Muslims, attacking Islam. And when Sheikh Dizad, you may have heard of Sheikh Ahmad Dizad, alhamdulillah. He's not well at present. May Allah give him shifa. He wanted to give an ad. Future world constitution. Future world constitution. It was an advertisement of the glorious Quran. Sheikh Didar wanted to pay. Whatever the normal charge is, he wanted to pay for a full page in the Time magazine. And the Time magazine refused the advertisement. Imagine. They refused a paid advertisement from IPCI, Islamic Propagation Center International, because it was promoting Quran. Can you believe? supposed to be neutral, supposed to be unbiased. The Time magazine refused, saying we are allowed to refuse any advertisement without giving any reason. That's one of the clauses. Indirectly, the clause is that they want to refuse things which go against them or which favor the Muslims. It's not mentioned in black and white, but that's in hidden words. Imagine. Indirectly, they are inoculating the people, the masses, with their philosophy, and with anti-propaganda against Islam. How many, how many daily newspapers do we have? How many Islamic daily newspapers? We don't have a single international daily Islamic newspaper. It's a shame on us. Like how New York Times, you'll get any part of the world. All the major cities of the world, you'll get New York Times. You'll get in Bombay, you'll get in Delhi, you'll get in Madras, New York Times. We Muslims have local papers, maybe in Bombay you have a few Urdu papers, maybe in Kerala you have a few Malayalam papers, you know, local papers. The circulation is limited, limited. In Bombay, maybe 10,000, 20,000, maximum 30 to 40,000 or 50,000, limited. Compared to Times of India, 4 lakhs, 400,000. And even these newspapers, Urdu newspapers in Bombay, 99% or 98% are being read by Muslims only not by non-Muslims. So how can you spread Islam? How can you convey a message to the non-Muslims? Media is a very important tool for conveying the message of Islam. What we should do, that we should have top-class journalists. Unfortunately, the Muslim Ummah, the Muslim world, have very few people who are good with the pen. Not that we can't make, but we don't want to make an effort. And there are some Muslims who are good with the pen, but they are, I would call, secular in inverted commas. Secular inverted commas. They write for all non-Islamic papers and all. There are a few good with the pen. What we require is a daily newspaper or a monthly magazine, which can penetrate into the masses. Alhamdulillah, a few Muslims, a few rich businessmen, they did make an effort in taking out such magazine on a monthly or a fortnightly basis, but it didn't click off as well as they had planned. What we require is the best people, and we should be able to capture all the three levels. Firstly, only by having good journalists, it's not sufficient. Because if you have good Muslim journalists, the editor sitting on top of him will not let that article be published in the magazine. So what's the use? Even if you have good editors, the boss of that newspaper will not allow you to publish that article in his newspaper or his magazine. So we Muslims should have a three-tier. It should be owned by Muslims, the editors should be top-class Muslims or good with the pen, as well as the journalists, all three levels. If any is missing, there are chances there may be certain lacuna. Top-class Muslim journalists, top-class editors, and good philanthropists and good people who own these press. 
and even the strategy of marketing should be A1. Then only can we penetrate into the media. I know, alhamdulillah, there are a few organizations which are trying their level best, and I'm told that Mazi Imam, alhamdulillah, they are trying to have courses on journalism, and there are people having in other parts, but what we require, the people training should be of international caliber. If you can't find Muslims, hire the non-Muslim to train them, no problem. No problem. If you can't find Muslims who can train, get the best non-Muslim actually to train in English writing, not about Islam, English writing. And once they're trained how to write in English, because English is an international language, or whatever language you want to make out the paper, and if you want to bring in a local language, teach them about local language. And then a person who's well-versed in the field of Islam can infiltrate the journalist with the ideas of Islam. If you don't have a Muslim who has good knowledge of Islam, who's good with the pen, get a non-Muslim. Should see to it that the trainers should be of top international repute. And we should see to it that when we pay these people in our papers, oh, working for Islamic paper, okay, how much salary are you getting in times of winner? 10,000. Okay, work for me for 5,000. How will he come? A person who's drawing 10,000, 20,000 in a non-Islamic newspaper, you ask him to work for half the salary or quarter the salary in your newspaper. How will he come forward? The Muslims should pay the Muslims more than the market. That's what we do in a foundation. In a foundation, alhamdulillah, all the people that are employed are getting more salary than what they can get outside in the market. So that tomorrow they won't say, oh, we are working for Islam, therefore we are getting half the salary. See, there are few people who Allah has given them enough wealth. If they work voluntary, they work at half the pay, no problem. But the masses, we should see to it that we give them what is their requirement. Then only can we extract them. Then we see to it that we take out double work from them. Pay them well and take out good work from them. That's what we require. Unfortunate in the Muslim organization that we have, even the Dawa organization, how many full-time do we have? How many? And you pay them a salary of 1,000 rupees. So the Imam, how much you pay? 1,500 rupees, 2,000 rupees. What's going to happen with that? Give them good substantial so that they can dedicate their full life for the cause of Islam. Now, analyzing the electronic media. In the electronic media, again, you have the audio cassette, you have the video, you have the computer, you have the satellite, etc. In audio cassettes, again, as I said, if it's non-periodical, reach is limited. How many audio cassettes can you make? How many video copies can you make, etc.? But still, it has a certain advantage. Like you're traveling in a car, you can play audio cassette, a talk on Islam, or a promoting Islam. And Alhamdulillah, the Islamic Research Foundation, that's based in Bombay, we have, Alhamdulillah, one of the largest collection of Islamic video cassettes in the world. More than three and a half thousand different titles we have. Three and a half thousand titles. I travel various parts of the world. I have not come across any organization which have anywhere close to one and a half thousand. Alhamdulillah, we have collected from various parts of the world more than three and a half thousand video cassettes, out of which more than 3,000 are in English, more than 500 are in Urdu, a couple of hundred are in Arabic, and a few in French, German, Spanish, etc. These cassettes we give on a free hire basis in Bombay against a refundable deposit of 200 rupees. The person can take the video cassette home, watch it free of charge for one week, he can keep it with him. Within one week, he should turn it back. He can take the deposit back or take another cassette, absolutely free. We even distribute literature, more than 50 different literature on Islam and compiled religion, absolutely free throughout India. And Alhamdulillah, the next media, as I told you, is the cable TV. We have been successful, and I can say Alhamdulillah, that Bombay is the only non-Muslim city in the world, which I know of. Bombay is the only non-Muslim city in the world, which I know of, where Alhamdulillah, every day, we show Dawa programs for three hours on the cable TV network to more than a million homes. More than a million homes. 10 lakh houses every day for three hours. Three hours hardcore dawa. You know why do I say hardcore dawa? Hardcore dawa means actually giving the message. You know, you see me talking on all these topics, direct message, without compromise. Not about salah and about kirat, that's important. You have one Muslim country channels showing salah and kirat, that's good. But that's not hardcore dawa. 
Alhamdulillah, every day for three hours, we show our programs on the cable TV network to more than a million homes. And do you know, those people that show these programs, more than 80% are non-Muslims. The people watching this program, more than 80% are non-Muslims. And when we started, initially, we had to pay. Oh, please show our program. They said, okay, we paid and they showed the program. Then it became popular. It became free. Now do you know, these non-Muslims are willing to pay us to show our programs on their channel. Non-Muslims giving us money. Here, yeah, Brother Zaki, take money. We want your programs. Why? Quality. Quality is important. Alhamdulillah, what we say, don't give us money, increase the time. From two hours, we said, show it for three hours, and they agreed. Actually, more time we give them, the more money they should pay us. We told them, don't show two hours, show three hours, we want to give it complimentary, free. Alhamdulillah. Allah has his ways. He gets his job done in his ways. If Muslim cannot do it, Allah gets it done from non-Muslims. Allah says in Surah Muhammad, chapter 47, verse number 38, if you turn away from the path, do not do your job. Yes, common gairakum. Summa laikunam salakum. If you do not do the job, Allah will stop in your place and other people. Summa laikunam salakum, and they will not be like you. The Jews were the chosen people. Allah asked them to follow the commandment, they didn't follow the commandment. Allah took them out and praised the Arabs. He made them sit on the head. Allah says, if you do not do the job, Allah will stop in your place and other people. Summa laikunam salakum, and they will not be like you. So if you do not do the job, Allah will take you out and bring other people. You know, today the fastest growing religion in the world is Islam, in America, in England. We Indians, supposed to be born in Muslim families, can't do the job. Allah gets people born in non-Muslim families, make them Muslim, and make them sit on your head. They are doing a job, alhamdulillah. The organization in states and Europe, they are far better than us. We are nothing compared to them. A shame on us. We haven't reached the media yet. In the film industry, Muslim are on the top, number one. Actors, number one Muslim. Film producers, number one Muslim. Music director, number one Muslim. Actress, number one Muslim. Are we using this technology for spreading Islam? It's a shame on us. Allah has given us the technique. It's a shame on us. You go to the Bombay film industry, number one are Muslims. If Muslim withdraw, the film industry will go down. How many film industry people are using the equipment and the technology to promote Islam? How many? It's a shame on us. Alhamdulillah, since the past couple of years, we have even been successful into penetrating the satellite channels. See, today if you analyze on the television, you have news media against Islam, against Islam. On the satellite, against Islam. You have channels which are giving news which are biased. And all the material you see, majority of the things on the satellite are un-Islamic, majority. We, Alhamdulillah, have been successful in showing our programs on various international channels. And Alhamdulillah, we have been able to show our program even on the ATN, Asian Television Network. You all might have heard of that, Asian Television Network. It's the channel which mainly shows film songs, Hindi film songs mainly. It's a very popular channel. Now it has been discontinued for a couple of months because they want to revamp the whole thing and come in a bigger way. So therefore, this continued. We Alhamdulillah show our program on the ATN, Asian Television Network, thrice a week, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, for half an hour, from 6 to 6.30. And this ATN reaches 68 countries in the world. 68 countries in the world. Imagine, Alhamdulillah, it's a desire that we should try and do maximum dawah what we can. At least we are able to stop the wrong activity for half an hour, the wrong things that are going on. Instead of that, we are promoting Islam. Therefore, you see the cameras that are there. They are basically cameras which can shoot on the satellite. These are special cameras that only if you record on these better cam cameras can you have it broadcast on the air. I am asking you, how many Muslim dawah organizations have beta cam cameras? How many? Do you know of any? It's a shame on us. Muslim businessmen, oh, they own studios, costing billions of rupees. Own studios and own the best of equipment. But how many Muslim dawah organizations do you have who have a beta cam setup? 
You can count them on your fingertips throughout the world. But only when you shoot on these high equipment can you have it broadcast on the satellite. If you shoot on normal VHS, it cannot go on the satellite. Maximum it can go on the video cassette in your home. That also quality is bad. And normally we have the Islamic, you know, lectures being shot. Oh, the camera is going on the ceiling, camera is coming down, out of focus, it's getting bad. Who would like to watch a video cassette which is not shot properly? But when you see the film, movies, oh, multi-camera job, you can see all scenery and everything, and a person enjoys. The Islamic lectures, out of focus, half-time ceiling is being seen, and you cannot see who the person is, it's not clear. When we present Islam, we should present it in the best way, par excellence. Therefore, Muslims should do things that they should be the best in that work. We see in the media that always they are presenting Islam in the wrong way. They're presenting Islam as terrorist. See, we have full-time channels such as BBC, CNN, presenting their view, presenting view of the Western world. The international channels, the international channels, they're presenting their view. And they're supposed to be neutral, but they give a wrong picture many a times. And the project, they show some shots of wars taking place in Afghanistan or somewhere here or in Palestine and present Islam in the bad light. Few times they do say, oh, the poor people are getting harassed and this and that. But if you see on a whole, on a whole, they're trying to create a neutral image, but actually they're undermining Islam. In Bosnia, you see, where we are being butchered, tortured, we are being harassed. They, they show it on the news, they have to show, otherwise they won't be called as neutral. But where little thing happens, any bomb blast takes place first, main suspect caught three Muslims in New York bomb blast. All Muslims, and the photograph will be, will be flashing on the news every half an hour, without proof. Then, after two months, they caught a wrong person, very small, you know, once they will show it. Oh, they caught a wrong person. But before damage is already done, the damage is done in the Muslim Ummah, showing continuously for weeks together that Muslims have done this bomb blast, etc. Then when they know it was wrong, when the world comes to know it is wrong, they give a small issue, oh, it was a wrong person they caught. On the newspapers you find, ah, 50-year-old Arab married a 16-year-old girl. Headlines, front page in Times of India, it will come at the bottom, on the third page. 50-year-old Arab marrying a 16-year-old girl. You have 50-year-old men in America raping 10-year-old girl, it doesn't come in the paper. Raping, it doesn't come. 50-year-old man raping, not once, several times, you see the statistics. Raping girls which have not reached maturity, it doesn't come in the paper, why? It's not news for them. Every day in America, 1,900 cases of rape take place. It is so common, it's not worth mentioning, you know. Every day, 1,900 cases of rape. Means every 1.3 minutes, one case of rape is taking place. I'm here since about 40 minutes. You know how many rapes have taken place? At least 30 in America by the time I'm giving this talk. 30 rapes have taken place. It doesn't come in the paper. The media is in their hand. They can project the way they want. We have to control the media. We are the Khaira Ummah. It's our job to deliver the message of truth to the whole humanity, we aren't doing it. Wallah, we aren't doing it. It's a shame on us. We require that we should have full-time Islamic satellite channels. We don't have a single. We have channels owned by Muslim countries, various, but they are not Islamic Dawa channels. On those Muslim countries, you may see Dhamas, you may see Western movies, all sorts of things you see. What we want, Islamic Dawa channels. The Christians have it, the Jains have it, the Hindus have it. Even the Qadianis have it. Do you know that Qadianis? MTV, Muslim TV, run by Qadianis, beam from London. Handful of the people, handful there. It's a shame on us. What are we doing? There are talks in the Muslim world, oh, inshallah, within one year, the channel is going to be launched. I'm hearing since IRF was started, since seven years I'm hearing, the channel is going to come, the channel is going to come. Every time I travel, channel is going to come. We have the petrodollars with us, but we don't have a single Islamic full-time Dawa channel. It's a shame on us. It doesn't cost a lot of money. See, the Muslims are so rich. 
that there are thousands of individual Muslims who can own 10 channels at a time, easy, only from the pocket money. It's not expensive for them. It's the pocket money. Chiller, chiller, change. They can have channels just by the change money. It's a shame on us. What are we doing? Allah has given us all the niyamat, the black gold. But what are we doing? Are we making an effort? So what we decided, we are very small. Our organization, IRF, is very small. Okay, till the time, if even our desire to start, Allah hasn't given us that funds. So we said, at least we start in a small way, and we started. And now our programs are being shown in America, in Bahrain, in Kuwait, in Gulf countries, in Malaysia, alhamdulillah, on irregular basis. On regular basis, on the ATN, on the NEPC, on certain channels, alhamdulillah. And inshallah, we are having talks with the ART. Inshallah, very soon it will be shown throughout the world on the ART, Arab radio television. And inshallah, Allah will see to it that even an Islamic Dawah channel will start, inshallah. Allah knows best who will he get the work done through. We have the computer media. We have computer, we have diskettes, we have CD-ROMs. Now internet has come, email has come. We have on the disk on the computer today. It's so easy. Alhamdulillah, the Islam Foundation has more than 200 different packages on the computer only on Islam. 200. We have the Quran, we have the Hadith, we have the Sharia, we have the Fiqh. You want to know that how many times is the name of Jesus Christ, peace be upon mentioned in the Quran? Press the button, you get the answer. 25 times. How many times is by the name Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned by name? Four times. Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 43. Surah Azab, chapter 33, verse 40. Surah Fatah, chapter 48, verse 29. Surah Muhammad, chapter 47, verse number 2. Fingertips. And as Ahmad once. Surah Saf, chapter 61, verse number 6. Fingertips. You want to know what does the Quran speak about? Nisa, woman? Press the button, you get the answer. You press another button, the printout comes out. You want to know what does the Hadith say about Salah? Press the button, you get the answer. Which is the Sahih Hadith? Which is the Sahih Hadith? Everything on your fingertips. The world is advancing. How many people utilize compact disc for research of Islam, for studying Islam? How many people? Can anyone raise their hand who uses compact disc? CD-ROM, you know? CD-ROM, one, alhamdulillah. See, Leva said creating, we don't have people using it. If we don't use it, how will we have the market? See, everything. We have the Qur'an of the Qur'an on audio CD, on CD-ROM. We have the translations in several languages. You have fiqh, sharia, hadith, everything on it. You have Islamic games for children. How do you attract children? You have to make a child Islamic from day one. Don't wait till he grows an adult and then talk about Islam. Right from the beginning, we in IRF have a children's wing, mainly catering from the age of three to nine. Right from young, you train them. Train them to be journalists, good in writing, right from the beginning. Don't wait till they become graduate and then train them. That you can do to those people who don't have the opportunity. That also you have to do. But catch them young. We have games on the computer, how to influence children to come closer to Islam. They can entertain, and yet they learn. And I've given a talk on Islam for children. You can observe that cassette. And I've shown the technique, how to attract the children right from childhood. Now, the world is advancing. Previously, we had the telephone. Then we had the fax. Now we have the email. Email. Call the electronic mail. Very cheap. Normally, when I send a fax to America, every page I have to spend about 100 to 150 rupees, depending upon the matter. In email, I send several pages only for one rupee. One rupee. But unfortunately, the Muslim organization don't have email. Now they have started. We are so backward. When the full world advances, then we Muslims want to adopt that. In email, you can communicate cheap, very fast, electronic mail. You type on your computer, press a button, reach is there. Simple. He opens this box. Box, we don't have to go to a post box. It just he presses the button, it comes on his screen. Easy. Directly from your doorstep to his doorstep. In fact, it takes time. Every page goes through here. Just press the button, reach it directly. How many people are utilizing this? Do you know today on the internet? Internet is advancing. The majority material on the internet on Islam is against Islam. Do you know that? On the internet, if you read about Islam, Mainly, there are non-Muslims written against Islam. They're mentioning Quran is not the word of God. There are so many grammatical errors in the Quran. There are so many unscientific points in the Quran, which no Muslim is replying. It's a shame on us. No Muslim is replying. Very few, few organizations. 
Very few organizations. There are chatting channels on the internet. There are channels. How you have satellite channels? It's somewhat different, but even they are called chatting channels. On the internet, you have chatting channels. Many of them are run by Christian missionary, known as Jesus Cafe, etc. When you enter this channel, you can have a question answer session with them. We in IRF, Alhamdulillah, we sit in Bombay and do dawa on an individual basis with people in America, people in UK, people in Singapore, throughout the world, Alhamdulillah, at the fingertips. We type, the question comes on his screen. He gives the answer, it comes on our screen. Are you aware that you can do dawa sitting in your home, sitting in your office, on one-to-one -one basis? You know, if I have to speak on telephone for two hours, you know how much I have to spend? If I have to speak to America, two hours, how much will it cost me? How much? Tens of thousands of rupees. On email, that's 10, 20 rupees. 30, 40 rupees. And not with one person, simultaneously I'm speaking with 20 people. It's like conferencing. I'm having a conference telephone with a person in America, one sitting in London, one sitting in Singapore, one in Malaysia, conferencing. All five are chatting with each other, doing dawa. If I have a conference line, how much will it cost me? The world is advancing. How many people know how to use the internet? But doing dawa, presenting Islam on these chatting channels is a different technique. It's altogether different. See, having knowledge of Islam is a must for any type of dawa, whether oral, whether writing, whether video, knowledge. But the technique keeps on changing. The technique keeps on changing. And we at IRF, alhamdulillah, we train the people how to talk. And we have a unique style of doing dawah that whenever we meet a non-Muslim, a non-Muslim comes to us, instead of talking a thousand good points about Islam, even after we convince a thousand good points about Islam, that non-Muslim will say, ah, you're the man who married more than one woman, ah. Ah, you're the man who keeps the woman in the veil. Oh, you're the people who don't have alcohol, don't have pork. Ah, you're the people who have non-veg, ruthless people. You speak a thousand good points, but the few negative points in his mind will never make him accept Islam. Never. So what we do, instead of talking a thousand good points about Islam, what we say is, what do you think is wrong with Islam? With your limited knowledge, whether right or wrong, whatever knowledge you have about Islam from media, from newspaper, from television, from magazine, what do you feel is wrong with Islam? And we tell him, brother, you're most welcome to criticize Islam. No problem. We can take it. We can take it. You want to criticize the Quran, no problem. Just give us the reason why do you criticize it. So they come up with a question. And we have done a survey and we have come to know there are hardly 20 questions which the non-Muslims have against Islam, which a common non-Muslim has. The common non-Muslim is 80% of non-Muslims. If they ask you questions on Islam, they will ask you five or six questions. All these five or six questions asked by common 80% of the non-Muslim will fall within these 20 questions. We have done a survey. Common 20 questions, like, as I told you, why is a Muslim man allowed to have more than one wife? Why do you keep the woman in the veil? Why do women inherit half the share of the men? Why do you all have non-veg? Why don't you all have pork? Why don't you have alcohol? What's the meaning of jihad? Why do you all worship the Kaaba? Why aren't non-Muslims allowed in the holy city of Makkah? These are the common questions they ask. So what we do, we want each and every Muslim in the world should be able to answer these questions pit pat with references. And these common 20 questions will remain the same, irrespective of whether you are in India, whether in America, whether in Europe, throughout the world, these 20 common questions are the same. There may be additional two or three questions based on the locality. Like when I had gone to state, the additional question was that, can we buy a house mortgage loan from a bank? Allowed, haram or halal. Can we have chicken from McDonald's? Can we have Kentucky Fried Chicken? Additional two questions. But the remaining 20 questions are the same. See, these 20 questions have emerged. How? Because the media is bombarding, by the help of the media, they're bombarding the people with this information. Against women, women in Islam don't get their rights, Quran conflicts with science. So these 20 questions have emerged. These 20 questions may change after five years, after two years. But today, these 20 questions are prevalent. So if every Muslim knows the answer of these 20 questions, you can neutralize 80% of the non-Muslims, 80%. These 20 questions may change after a few years. But now, you should be prepared. And when you give the answer, 
we give the answer on various levels. We should train them. We should be professionals. How many professional diets do we have? How many? How many full-time diets do we have in the Muslim world? Supposed to be a religion of missionaries. Do you know the Christians have 60,000 crusaders raising dust throughout the world? 60,000 paid people, paid full-time workers. Not clerks and all, actual dawa giving talks throughout the world. 60,000. How many international diets do we have? You can count them on your fingertips. How many? It's a shame on us. We are supposed to be a religion of missionaries. It's a shame on us. And when we give the replies, we go on various levels. First quote from the scripture, if it's then the Quran or the Hadith, give the quotation. If it's then the religious scripture of the Hindu, the Bible, quote that. Then go to the level. Second level is of logic. Third is on science. Give the answers on different levels, quoting scriptures, ask scripture and their scriptures, then quote the answer with reason and then with scientific data and statistics. For example, someone asks us, why not to have pork? If you ask this question to any IRS speaker, Islamic Research Foundation speaker, the tape recorder will go on. It's mentioned in the Quran in no less than four different places. Surah Bakra chapter 2, verse number 173. Surah Mahatha chapter 5, verse number 3. Surah Anam chapter 6, verse number 145. Surah Nahal chapter 16, verse number 115. Then go to Arabic. Forbidden for you for food are ah, dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine, and any food on which any name besides Allah has been invoked. Then if you're the Christian, you can go from the Bible. The Bible says in Leviticus, chapter number 11, verse number 7 and 8. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 14, verse number 8. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 65, verse number 2 to 5. The Christian is shocked. It has an impact. This is called a way of communicating. When you quote from the scripture, he is shocked. Then come to the reason of science. Give a scientific answer. There are no less than 17 different diseases which a person can have when he has pork, the flesh of swine. He can have phenia solium. He can have TT. It causes more fat building material than muscle building material. Then go to logical answer. It's the filthiest animal in the world. It's the most shameless animal in the world. You should give the answer in certain levels. You may never know. One person will be impressed because the scripture says that is sufficient. The other person will say, I don't care if the Quran and the Bible says. Prove to me scientifically. Then you prove scientifically. So when you give an answer, it should be able to satisfy majority of the people. Your answer should not satisfy only a few group of people. The answer should be such, it should satisfy Muslims and non-Muslims alike. It's a technique. How many people are trained? We are full-time doctors. We are full-time engineers. We have full-time advocates. How many full-time dais do we have? The Quran says, as I quoted in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 110, it's compulsory for everyone to do dawa, at least part-time dai. But the Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 104, let there arise out of you a group of people who enjoy what is good and forbid what is wrong. These are the ones to attain felicity. Quran is speaking about full-time dais. There should be a group of full-time dais. It's the duty of the ummah to support them. When the Christian missionary says, that pray, you know what he means? He means money. He means money. Jimmy Swaggart, who had a debate with Sheikh Ahmed Didad, every day he used to receive a donation of $1 million to keep his head above water. $1 million. He used to be seen on more than 150 countries on the satellite. That's in 80s, you know, 80s. 150 countries used to be seen. $1 million a day. When he says pray, people give him money. We Muslims, we do dua. We Muslims, alhamdulillah. We do dua. Ah, ma apke liye dua karenge. Oh, we will do prayers for you. See, prayers is required. Allah's help is maximum that we require. We require duas. But the Muslim is a bit selfish. Majority of us. It's free, free of charge. When we ask actually to give something which will go away from material loss, they will not come forward. It's a shame on us. We are supposed to be the community which gives the maximum charity. What we require, we require training. It's an art how to communicate, whether in writing, whether in speech, whether in public, whether on the internet. It's an art. It's a different technique. We train an RF how to do with a person if you're traveling in a bus. You, know, you will be with him only for about 20 minutes. Then you'll get down. You may never meet with him ever in your life. He's a part non-Muslim. How to do with a person who you're going to spend 20 minutes is an art. You can't give a lecture, okay, now I want to talk on concept of God and major religion. He'll listen to you. It's a technique. How you do dawah with your colleagues who you meet in your office every day. 
how to dava with your classmate you meet in school or university every day. It's a different technique. You may be with him for a few years. How to dava with your neighbor who you may spend 20 years with? It's a different technique. How to initiate? You can't say, okay, brother John, I want to talk to you about Islam. Please give me 20 minutes. He won't give you. You have to instigate him to ask you questions. It's a technique. How do you instigate him to ask you questions? It's a technique. You can refer to my cassette on techniques of dawah. But I've given talks how to instigate the person. He will tell you, please, brother, give me half an hour. I want to know about Islam. That same man, it's a technique. Like how the people are giving us money to show our programs. Technique. How to speak on stage is a technique. What should your distance be from the mic? How do you move your hand? How do you modulate your sound is a technique. It's an art. The Christian missionaries, they are trained in Harvard University. Do you know that? They are MBAs. How many MBAs do we have in the field of Dava? How many? How many? How many do we have? Very few. Hardly if you search, you may be able to find. Alhamdulillah, we have in our foundation MBAs. Brother Naushan Nurani is an MBA. We have people who are medical doctors who are full-time dies besides myself. We have people who are trained. We want the cream of society. In the Muslim Ummah, what we have, that you put him in school. If he fails, you put him in Dawal Ulum. When he's unsuccessful, we want to put him in Dawal Ulum. We require the cream of the society to preach Islam, not the rejects. Alhamdulillah, yet we have great ulamas. It's because of Allah, it's not because of us. We require the best. You teach him about medicine, if he can pass MBBA, that means he has a certain level of intelligence. Let your one son or one daughter go into the field of dawah. But no, oh, I've spent lakhs of rupees for him to become doctor. How can I sacrifice my son who's going to earn for me lakhs of rupees? How can I? Oh, I've made him an engineer. I've flogged out, the parents will say, how can he go for dawah now? If he fails in lower classes, you say, oh, I've sacrificed my son for Islam. Hypocrites. Hypocrites. What are we? We require the best, we require the cream of the ummah, not the rejects. In spite of that, alhamdulillah, we have great scholars coming out from Dawud They are doing hard work. They are doing good work, alhamdulillah. But it's a shame on us. We require trained people. Islam always speaks about excellence, about the best. We are the khaira ummah, the best of people. Whatever we do, we should be the best. I tell the people that you may do a very small job. You may be a jhaduwala, a sweeper, but be the best. Try and excel in that field. If you are a mochi or cobbler, be the best cobbler. As long as the job is lawful, it's halal, see that you excel in that job. We require the best of the people. And now media and communication is expanding. The whole world has become a globe. It's very easy to communicate. And if we Muslims, if we do not propagate the deen, I pity our state. See, nothing happened to Islam. I'm not bothered about Islam. You know why? Allah gives a promise in the glorious Quran. Three places. In Surah Tawbah chapter 9 verse 33, and Surah Saf chapter 61 verse 9, Allah says, Huwa allazi arsa rasoolahu biluda wa deenul haq liu zira wa deenay kulli fakar mushikun. That Allah has sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other ways of life. Over all the other ism, whether it be communism, secularism, atheism, Islam is destined to supersede all, overcome them all, master them all. However much the pagans don't like it, however much the mushrik don't like it. And Allah repeats the message in Surah Fatah, chapter 48, verse 28. Allah has sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other ways of life, over all the other ism, whether it be atheism, communism, secularism, any religion. Islam is destined to supersede all, overcome them all, master them all, and enough is Allah as a witness. With or without you, with or without me, the rubbish that you and I are. What are we? Nothing. The rubbish that you and I are. With or without you, with or without me, Allah has promised that his deen of Islam, deen al haq will prevail over the full world. Allah doesn't require you and me. Allah has his ways. Allah is giving us an opportunity to do a prophet's job and to earn a prophet's reward. It's a shame on us. Allah doesn't require you and me. Allah is giving us an opportunity. Make hay while the sun is shining. If you put your efforts in this way, you'll go to Jannah. Allah doesn't require you and me to spread his religion. He's giving us an opportunity to make hay while the sun is shining. 
The Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse number 125. Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. I would like to end my talk by giving the quotation of the glorious Quran from Surah Fusilat, chapter 41, verse 33, which says, Woman ahasanu kaala mimman da ila lahi wa amil salihaan wa kaala inna ni minal muslimin. Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, works righteousness, and then says, I'm the first to bow to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa akhru da'wan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakallah. Thank you, Dr. Zakir Naik. We now move on to the second part of the program, which is the question and answer session. For the purpose of the question and answer session, May we have slips of papers being sent over here so that we may pose these uh, questions as well as those of you who are interested in asking questions directly to Dr. Zakir Naik, there are two mics that have been provided in the auditorium. You have one in the ladies section and sisters who are keen on asking questions to Dr. Zakir Naik may pose questions to him on the mic over there. And we have one over here right in the front next to the stage and uh, members of the gents audience who wish to ask questions may also do so. Let me briefly tell you what should be the guidelines that we would like to observe during the question and answer session so that we derive maximum benefit. One person at a time would be allowed to ask a question. If you have more than one questions, please await your turn at the end of the queue so that when your chance comes, you can ask your second question. After you have asked the question, please do not go back to your seat. Remain standing at your position so that Dr. Zakir and I can address you while answering your question. May we have the questions over here so that we can begin soon, please. Please, sister, may we have your first question? Okay. Assalamu alaikum. In an attempt to promote Islam, is it all right to quote from the translations of the Quran? And if so, how do we know which translations are authentic? So, sister asked the question that while promoting Islam, giving the message of Islam, can we quote the translation of the glorious Quran? And if we have to do, then how do we know which is authentic? Sister, there are various translations available in the languages. As I told you, approximately 100 or a little bit more than 100. What do you have to do, sister? A person who's an expert in both the languages, Urdu, Urdu and Arabic, you have to ask the person who's well-versed in both the languages which is a better translation. The best, what I always say, that if every Muslim knows Arabic as a language himself, that's the best. So himself can judge what is right, what is wrong. He himself can get the message of the Quran directly and then propagate amongst the people. But since I know that 80% of the Muslim world doesn't know Arabic, what you can do is that you can ask the person who's an expert in that field, who knows that language, maybe Malayalam or maybe Tamil, whatever language it is, and Arabic, and see whether it's right or wrong. And those people are well-versed in both the languages, they will be able to tell you which translation is correct. Or you can compare the various translations that you have, if there are more than one, if there are ten, you can compare and you'll find that majority of the places, they are common. In some places, there are different opinions. So when the place of different opinion arises, that time you can go and ask a person who's well versed in both the languages, which is more correct. And a person who has knowledge of the Sai Hadith also. Besides having knowledge of the Quran, many times the commentary of the Quran is given in Sai Hadith. So a person who's well versed with Quran and Sai Hadith, he will be in a better position to explain to you that which commentary is better and which translation is better. Hope that answers the question. We have received certain slips of questions over here. The first question that is posed to Dr. Zakir Naik is that the media always portrays Muslims to be very ruthless and barbaric. And one of the instances that they quote very often is uh, the slaughtering of animals. Uh, why do Muslims slaughter the animals in a ruthless manner by torturing it slowly and painfully killing it is a common question that a lot of non-Muslims writers portray in the media. How does one answer this onslaught? So that was the question, and it's a good question, that the media and non-Muslims portray Islam as a ruthless religion, as a merciless religion, and the quote instance that why do Muslims and you all kill the animal, when you want to eat the animal, you are slaughtered in a particular fashion, so ruthlessly, you all torture him slowly and you make him die slowly and so painfully, why not directly in one shot, you know, one shatka finish, why are you all so ruthless? And one there was an argument going on between a Muslim and a Sikh. You know, Sikh is a person who comes mainly from Punjab, you know. They start from there, Sikh is a person who wears a turban, they are Sikhs. We have approximately 2% of Sikhs in India. So once a Muslim brother of ours and a Sikh was having a discussion. 
And the Sikh was saying, oh, you Muslim, you are ruthless people. You all torture the animal painfully. Why don't just give one jhatka and finish the animal is dead? Why kill the animal so mercilessly? So our Muslim brother, he replied, let's see. You Sikhs, you are a coward people. You attack from behind. We Muslims, we are marat ka bacha. We attack from the front. This was a battle of wits. It's not the right answer. It's a battle of wits. He didn't know, so he said, oh, you are a coward people. Attack from behind. We are marat ka bacha. We are brave, courageous. We attack from the front. That's not the answer why the Muslim slaughter. That he was using his hikmah. The reason that the Muslim do Zabi Ha is the Arabic word for the Islamic way of sacrifice, of slaughtering, is Zabi Ha. Is during Zabi Ha, there are certain conditions that the knife should be sharp and the cut should be quick and various conditions. And amongst them, the main is that you should take the name of Allah and you should even cut the windpipe and the vessels of the neck. The jugular veins and the arteries out here you should cut. The reason that we cut the windpipe and jugular veins and the vessels of the neck is because when we cut, we should see to it that we don't damage the spinal column. Only cutting the front part, the animal is yet alive. The heart is yet pumping. So when the animal is yet alive and the heart is yet pumping, the majority of the blood flows out of the body of the animal. Majority of the blood. The reason that we want the blood to flow out of the animal's body is because today science tells us that blood is a very good media of germ, bacteria, and toxins. And if we have this blood along with the meat, there are high chances that you may get various diseases. So we Muslims, we are hygienic people. That is the reason when we slaughter, we slaughter in the Islamic fashion. And besides that, meat, which is slaughtered by the Islamic way of Zabiha, remains fresh for a longer time. Remains fresh for a longer time as compared to meat by chatka, directly with the one shot or by stunning or letting the blood remain. Because blood is a good media of German bacteria, the meat can get rotten very fast. So it remains fresh for a longer time. And besides that, if you analyze, it's a misconception that the animal feels pain. Because when we do zabi have any slaughter and we cut the vessels of the neck, the blood supply, which goes to the nerve, which is responsible for feeling of the pain, that blood supply is cut off. So the animal does not feel pain. The blood supply going to the nerve, which is responsible for feeling of pain, is severe. So the animal does not feel pain. I do know that the animal kicks and rithers, but the kicking and rithering is due to the gush of flow of blood. It is not due to pain. In fact, on the other hand, in stunning, when you hit the animal hard, the animal feels tremendous pain. Here, it's a quick cut, and the blood supply to the nerve going is severe, and the animal does not feel pain. He dies after a few minutes, three, four minutes, but it's not torture to death. In stunning, very often the animal dies after five minutes, very often. Sometimes may die on the spot, but very often, even that animal also shivers. But in the Zabia method, he does not feel pain. Even stunning directly also if he dies, yet it is more inhuman than the Islamic method in which the blood flows out, German bacteria is less, the meat remains fresh for a longer time, and the animal does not feel pain at all. Hope that answers the question. May we have the next question, please? Brother, assalamu alaikum. I'm Junaida from Mangalore. Um, some Maulvis say that journalism is not a good profession for Muslims. They say it consists more, more of ghaybat, which Islam does not permit. But brother, when I'm unhappy to say that those are the one who does not, uh, those are the one who do, who do not forget to read the rumors page when they have the paper in their hand. The sister has posed the question that some of the Malvi say that journalism is not a good profession because it consists of gibbat. And besides that, these are the same people who when read the newspaper, they read the newspaper of humor or rumors, whatever it is. So isn't these people are contradicting? Sister, Journalism is of various types. Why do those Malvis read whether they lead or not? I don't know, sister. Whether the Malvis read rumor or don't read rumor, I'm not aware of that. You can have each individual Malvi is a different person, so you can't just blame all Malvis together. You can't paint all the people with the same brush. I don't know which Malvi you are referring to. But coming to the first part of the question, that some people say that journalism involves gibbat. Sister, journalism is of various types. You have general journalism, yellow journalism, where you simply malign people. You have journalism which is good. And you have to follow the basic guidance of the Quran, which says in Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse 81, Wakul jal haq wa zaqal batin. Inna la batin When truth is heard again, falsehood, falsehood perishes. 
for falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. So if you are doing journalism, see to it that you always speak the truth. I do know the Quran says, give us this wrong, it's for a Humaza chapter 104, verse number one. Why lulli kulli humazatil lumaza. Woe to every kind of scandal monger and backbiter. The Quran says in Surah Hujurah chapter 49, verse number 11 and 12, that do not backbite. If you backbite, it's as though you're eating the meat of a dead brother. I do know backbiting is wrong. So in journalism, you don't have to backbite, sister. And one more thing is there, that what is made public, suppose a person does something evil, and if you warn the people that this person is a bad person, that's not called a backbiting. If you call a backbiting, I would say that type of backbiting is allowed in Islam. Where if you're warning someone, for example, the Hadith of beloved Prophet which says that if somebody comes to ask you that you want to marry so-and-so person, and you know the background of that person, you say, no, that boy is not good, he has alcohol. If that's called backbiting, that type is allowed. Because you're warning the person against certain harm. So if you're warning the people of the ummah against certain harm of certain person, this type is allowed in Islam. So in journalism, if it's the truth, and you warn the people against some calamity, against certain evil, Islam gives you permission. But don't write wrong things just to earn money. So that article will sell, and you speak against someone so that that person gets the vote, or somebody gives you money, 10,000 rupees, okay, write against this politician, write against this institute, write against this group. All this happens, you know. It happens more in the Muslim press. That you take this money and write against this organization, you take this money, write in favor of this organization. This type of journalism is haram. If it's the fact, you can very well say, sister, and we require journalists. It's part of dawah. It's the part of the duty of the Muslim ummah to spread the message of Islam. Today is the age of journalism, technology, satellite, etc. You have to utilize this media to spread Islam, sister. Hope that answers the question. Do we have any questions from the gen section? Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I am Hashim Ali. Uh, Brother Jakir Naik, my question is, it was published in an article, I can't remember that uh, magazine name, uh, regarding Miraj of uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It says, in the 6th century, a fool claimed that he went to heaven. How will we, uh, we the Muslim Ummah clear this type of misconception? So they asked me a question that he did an article that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to heaven. How can Muslim Ummah create such a misconception? Whether prophets have been given various miracles, and prophets can do miracles, they are signs of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. What are referring to the Mihraj of beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? The references are given in the Quran in Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse number one, that the Prophet was transported from Masjid al Haram to Masjid Aqsa. Masjid al Haram to Masjid Aqsa. And then you read in the Sahih Hadith in Sahih Bukhari that the Prophet went to the heavens, etc. It's a fact. Thing is that these are miracles. Like the Quran says that Musa al Salam split the ocean into two, the sea into two. Isa al Salam, he was born without a male intervention. These are miracles. Neither can science disprove, neither can science confirm. That goes in the ambiguous slot. What we say, these were the prophets of God, they were messenger of God, they were given certain miracles. So these were done with the permission and will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hope that answers the question. We have a brother by the name of Joseph Matthew who, whose question is, why do Muslims call Islam as the best religion when there are many Muslims who are unreliable and dishonest? These Muslims are involved in activities such as frauds, bribing, cheating, or dealing in drugs. Can you please explain? So the question posed was that why do you call Islam as the best way of life when you find Muslims dealing in drugs, dealing in alcohol, cheating, etc. Why Islam is the best? You can defer to my video cassette. I've given the talk Islam, the universal religion, Islam interaction, and there I've proven that why Islam is the best way of life. For well, Islam not only speaks good things, it shows you a way how to achieve that good thing. And if you heard in my talk, I always speak about Islam as the best way of life. The reason that you find that, you know, people saying Muslims are bad, they deal in alcohol, they deal in drugs, they deal in this. I do know that there are black sheep in every community. I do know Muslims, though Quran says alcohol is prohibited, some Muslim can drink the non-Muslim under the table. I do know that. The media is in the hands of the Western world. The media project Islam in the wrong way. We do have black sheep in the community, even in Islam, even in Muslims we have black sheep. As I give the example, that if you find one Arab, age of 50, marrying a girl of 15 years old, it becomes a headline in the paper. You know, as though every day you find thousands of Arabs marrying 16 years old girls. i be projecting it that way. And on the other hand, when you have a non-Muslim, 50 years old man, raping a 10 years old girl, it's nowhere there in the news. See, media is in their hands. 
So they influence the people to make Muslims look like terrorists, like fundamentalists, like bad people. They project it that way. So because media is in their hands, they give a wrong picture. I'm not saying that we don't have Muslims who are bad. Actually, a Muslim cannot be bad. Because Muslim means one who submits his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he submits his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will not gamble, he will not rob, he will not have drugs, he will not rape, he will not molest. These Muslims, they are namesake Muslims. They are lip service Muslims. They are pseudo Muslims. They are untrue Muslims. They are black sheep in our community. But in spite of this, Alhamdulillah, yet, yet, as a whole, Muslim as a whole, yet, Alhamdulillah, with all the drawbacks that we have, yet, Alhamdulillah, we are the biggest community of teetotalers. Teetotalers means we don't touch alcohol as a whole. We are the biggest community that gives maximum charity with all our drawbacks. Alhamdulillah. We are the community which has the maximum modesty, maximum sobriety, alhamdulillah, with all the black sheep in our community. So firstly, I'll blame the media. And besides that, even if someone says that, okay, Muslims are bad. Suppose, hypothetically, I do agree that most of the Muslims are bad, hypothetically. But what I say, in my talk, I speak about Islam as the best way of life. I don't speak about Muslims as the best. And if, suppose, you want to judge a car, suppose you have a Mercedes car, and you want to analyze how good the car is. A person who does not know how to drive the car, he sits on the steering wheel and he bangs up the car. Who will you blame? Will you blame the car or the driver? Who will you blame? The driver. The driver did not know how to drive the car. He didn't have a license, first time he's driving a car. Similarly, if there are Muslims who are not practicing Islam correctly, blame the Muslims, not the religion. If you want to judge the religion, judge according to authentic sources, the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. And if you want the exemplary Muslim, the best Muslim example is our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's no better example. If you want to judge a car, put the best driver and then judge it. The best person, best exemplary Muslim as the Quran says in Surah Kalam, chapter 16, verse number 4, verily thou art standard on the highest standards of character. Quran says in Surah Azab, chapter 33, verse 21, that verily in the messenger you'll find the most beautiful pattern of conduct. The best example is our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's the best example. If you want to judge Islam, judge by his behavior. No wonder Michael H. Hart, a person who's an American, who's a Christian, who wrote a book on the 100 most influential people in history. The 100 most influential people in history, right from Adam, peace be upon him, till present time. And number one he gave, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He's not a Muslim. Why should he give Prophet Muhammad number one, peace be upon him? It's a fact. He was an honest person. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, number three. Number one is Muhammad, peace be upon him. Best exemplary. I do know people who say, oh, you know, you find that you find no Muslim country which is good and there goes a bad thing and this thing. I said, see, I do know that there's not a single country in the world who's following Islam in total. But there are countries which follow certain parts. Those countries which follow criminal law, you find crime the least in that country. Those which follow the economic law, you find economics the best in that country. If you want to judge any community as a whole, a country or a state which are the best, at the time of the beloved Prophet, best example. At the time of the four rightly guided Khalifas, Hazrat Abu Bakr, Hazrat Umar, Hazrat Usman, Hazrat Ali, may Allah be pleased with them all. Best example, see the community at that time. It was the best. If you want to judge as a state, by implementing Islam completely, what results come? See the times of the rightly guided Khalifa and the time of the beloved Prophet. That's the best. Hope to answer the question. May we have the next question from the sister's side. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Naushin, from, a school student from Mangalore. My question is, is a Muslim woman with full parda allowed to work in television for news bro broadcast station as it takes place in Saudi Arabia? The sister asked a question that can a woman in full parda, you are referring to the face being open, I believe. Face being open, no? Cover. Uh, till, like eyes are open. Sorry? Eyes can be seen. Eyes can be seen. Eyes being covered. Sister is saying that if a lady is supposed to give a news on a television with full face covered, only eyes can be seen, and she gives the news, is it allowed? Sister, if you have all the men in the Muslim world dead, then I would say no problem. Are the men dead? A man giving with proper clothes is much more better. The impact will be better. The thing is that when dawah should be done, the women should do among women, the men among men. Sometimes it can be done on different levels, like on a stage I'm doing and people are watching, no problem. On one-to-one -one basis, etc. The women are supposed to maintain the hijab. 
and it is against the principle of hijab that the women come on the television. Television. So it's much more preferred that but I said a man should do it. If all the men are dead in the world, all the Muslim men, and then he passed the question, I said, okay, maybe I've got no objection. But you have many men, alhamdulillah. I've got no objection if the audience is only women. Then she can even uncover her face, she can even uncover her head and give a talk, give a lecture, no problem. Only females, because you know, Islam believes as far as possible segregation of sexes. So when it comes to giving news reading, there's bound to be various men who may not lower their gaze properly, who may not listen to the news properly. It will be wrong on your part to allow them to have that thing. So it's preferable that men read the news in these conditions. Hope that answers the question. May we have the next question, please? Dr. Zahir Naik, Zahir Naik. Uh, my name is Mahbub Khan. I am from Mangalore. I am engaged in agriculture. So you have been talking uh, very concernedly about the uh, readership of the newspapers, non-electronic uh, media. Uh, hopefully, we have a situation. Uh, our education system is so poor that uh, naturally we cannot expect any readership there. And as far as the English papers, very few English papers that are concerned. Uh, in 1992, I remembered having a picked up a copy of uh, Islamic Voice that they had featured the death of uh, uh, Muhammad Asad. And that the feature, it was written that he was born in Australia. If the administration of a paper is lacking so much in the geography, as from Australia, they cannot make a difference as between Australia and Austria. It is, I mean, how can you uh, expect a non-Muslim to appreciate a paper? And the grammatical mistakes are, I, I'm sorry, um, uh, Dr. Nayak, uh, my question is not within the definition of a question. You may have to uh, bear with me for a few moments. Uh, please, uh, may I request you to Brother, come to your question? Because you can, we can't because hear you. No, no, the entire please, thing, please. Entire, uh, entire lecture of today is, uh, I mean, what you call, centered upon the lack of, I mean, what you call, mass communica uh, communication, and we don't have the education uh, amongst the Muslims. It's a wonderful question, Brother. The Brother asked a good question that today in the Muslim Ummah, we don't have proper education and we don't have proper training, etc. So my lecture is based on that. That's why I'm giving a talk to inspire. There may be certain philanthropists here or may see the cassette who may start having good education. And I'm giving a talk on Islam for children, showing how to start schools based on the Quran and Hadith. How can you have good school in the modern time? Having the knowledge of modern world as well as Quran Hadith simultaneously. I've given talks for that also. The brother said that he read in Islamic voice, Muhammad Asad, he is born in Austria, that I know, but they mentioned by mistake Australia. How can they make a difference? The difference only of Austria and Australia, AL, is added extra. So, brother, do you know Times of India is supposed to be the best paper, correct, in India? Times of India. Brother, do you know or not? Times of India in English is supposed to be one of the best. Right or wrong? Yes, I appreciate it. Do you know, I find on the first page, minimum 20 mistakes, minimum. Let me give minimum 20 mistakes. Minimum 20 mistakes. A person should be trained to find out the mistakes. I do know, even in times of Indian, first page only, minimum you'll find either spacing mistake, either comma mistake, either grammatical, and they have the best people in times of India. Less mistakes you have in weekly paper and monthly paper, I don't know. That doesn't mean I'm supporting Islamic voice. I'm not supporting. What I'm telling you, Alhamdulillah, with whatever limited thing he had, at least he's doing. What you should say, I will start a newspaper, inshallah, there will not be a single mistake. We Muslims have a habit of pointing at the finger. Oh, he's not doing that. I'm not blaming you, brother, I'm not blaming you. I'm not telling you are doing that. I'm giving the Muslim view. I'm not telling you are blaming. What we should do, we should say, okay, I will start a paper better than Islamic voice, alhamdulillah. No problem. But if you can't at least support that paper, we should not pull each other's leg. What we are doing, Muslims are wasting more time. If I want a paper, what you should do? You should support that paper and then we'll make a new paper. We in IRF, we support the other Dawah organization. We don't say, oh, this Jamaat Islami is wrong, so I'll pull him down. This Salaf organization is wrong. Support everyone and you do Dawah. Because we are doing for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Support all the organization, whatever is coming, support them and even you do. Don't pull each other's leg. Least you can do is stay neutral. Least. That itself is great. But Muslim organization pulling each other's leg, ah, this organization, I want to pull his leg so that people will think I'm the best. When you will be best? Arre, when you support everyone, Allah will help you. If you get Allah's help, that's the best. And I do agree with the brother that today what we're lacking is basic education. How many institutes do we have today who we can call are excel in the field of education? 
even if I have to send my son, who's about four years now, I doubt whether I send him to a Muslim school. We have Muslim schools in Bombay, but the level of education is atrocious. I'm sorry to say. I'm sorry to say. I know these people, they may be good people in the institution, but if you compare them with the missionary schools, their education is much higher. What do we do? If you feel that you cannot give a proper Islamic background to your schools, yet put them in Muslim school. But if you're confident that you can give Islamic background at home and put them in missionary schools, and your son can do dawa in missionary school, then you can put them in missionary school. Otherwise, don't put. Don't put in missionary school. If you have confidence that you can give enough Islamic knowledge, the parents themselves don't know Islam. What will they teach their children? If you are confident enough that you can train your child enough about Islam and even do dawa in that school, then I've got no objection if he goes to a missionary school. Otherwise, put him in a Muslim school, even if the Muslim school standard is low. At least his iman will be safe. Otherwise, he goes and becomes a doctor and goes far away from Islam. What's the use? So what we require, brother, now is institutions which are excelling in education, in modern education as well as deen together. Unfortunately, we have a segregation. The deen madaris, those that teach Quran fiqh separately and those which teach modern education separately. Even Quran is modern. We require a striking balance between the both. Teach both simultaneously. There are very few such organizations in the world which teach both simultaneously. Islamic values, Quran, Hadith, Sharia, and the education which we learn in science and technology, etc. If we have this, and then if we excel our people in this field, inshallah, this will not be there. And we have to train our people how to do proofreading is a technique. How to record mistakes is a technique that when in journalism also, those people have done the course of journalism will realize that taking out mistakes is also a technique. So more experienced a Muslim is in that field, the paper will be better. Hope that answers the question. There's a question posed by a member of the audience saying that Islam is often made a target in the media, uh, mentioning that Islam is very intolerant and it's very fundamentalist. And uh, they mentioned that non-Muslims are not allowed in the city of Mecca and Medina, which are the holy sites of Islam. Why is this so? Why are non-Muslims not allowed in the holy city of Mecca? So the question posed is that Islam is an intolerant religion, they're fundamentalist, why aren't the non-Muslims allowed in the city of Mecca? Regarding that Islam are fundamentalist, etc., I've given a talk on is religious fundamentalism a stumbling block to the freedom of expression. It's a debate between myself and the other speakers. You can refer to that cassette. That cassette will give the answer in detail about fundamentalism, about terrorists, etc. Regarding the main question, that why aren't non-Muslims allowed in the holy city of Mecca? Why aren't? See, if you analyze that even an Indian, suppose I'm an Indian, and I'm an Indian, even if I have to go, in certain areas, I'm not allowed to go in India. Those are the cantonment area. You know cantonment, the military area? The government doesn't give me permission to go in that area. Though I am a bona fide citizen of India, yet the Indian government will not allow me to go in certain areas which are known as cantonment area. Those are special areas for those people who are well-versed and mainly meant for protecting the country and they're trained in that, etc. Other normal citizens aren't allowed. Similarly, Islam is for the whole world, for all the human beings. But the cantonment area of Islam, the peaceful area, what we call, is the Harmain, Makkah and Medina. Here, no one besides the staunch believers of Islam can go. That's the cantonment area. You cannot go without being a staunch believer. Otherwise, Islam is for all human beings. Not that we are against them. But whenever you want to enter any country, you require a visa. If I have to go to America, to England, to Singapore, to Malaysia, I apply for a visa. And when I apply for a visa, there are certain questionnaires, certain questions I have to answer, certain things I have to agree with. For example, when I go to Singapore, it was mentioned in the form, immigration form, death to drug traffickers, death penalty to all those who deal with drugs. I cannot say, oh, this punishment is very harsh. I don't agree with this. If you don't agree, no entry in Singapore. So if I have to enter Singapore, I have to agree that if I am caught with drugs, I will be hanged. Death penalty. No option. If you don't agree with that law, don't enter the country. So if you want to apply for a visa, you have to agree with the laws of that country. Similarly, if any human being wants to enter Makkah or Medina, you have to apply for a visa. The visa for Makkah and Medina is to say with your lips verbally, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. There's no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon the messenger of Allah, and no one can prevent you from entering there. Uh, Brother Sundar Rao is keen on asking Dr. Zakir Naik, why do Muslims 
call Almighty God Allah. The question posed was, Prophet Sundar Rao, that why do Muslims call God by the name Allah? The glorious Quran says in Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse 110, Kulidullah Abidur Rahman, Ayya Amatadu, Falal Asnal Husna. Say, call upon him by Allah, or by call upon him by Rahman. By whichever name you call upon him, to him belongs the most beautiful name. You can call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by any name, but it should be a beautiful name. It should not conjure up a mental picture. And the Quran gives this message in Surah Araf, chapter 7, verse 180, Surah Taha, chapter 20, verse number 8, and Surah Al Hashar, chapter 59, verse number 24, that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala belongs the most beautiful name. And there are no less than 99 different attributes given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the glorious Quran, like Rahman, Rahim, Al Hakim, most merciful, most gracious, most wise. 99 attributes. And the crowning one is Allah. Why do we Muslims prefer calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the Arabic name Allah instead of the English word God? It's because the English word God, you can play mischief with that English word God. For example, if you add a S to God, it becomes God's. That means plural of God. There's nothing like plural Allah in Islam. Kul hu Allah hu ad. Say he's Allah one and only. If you add a D E S S to God, it becomes Goddess. That means a female God. There's nothing like male Allah or female Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unique. Allah has got no gender. If you add a father to God, it becomes Godfather. He's my Godfather. He's my guardian. There's nothing like Allah Father or Allah Abba in Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a unique word. If you add a mother to God, it becomes Godmother. There's nothing like Allah Mother or Allah Ami in Islam. If you prefix sin before God, it becomes sin God. That means a fake God. There's nothing like sin Allah in Islam. Therefore, we Muslims, we prefer calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the Arabic name Allah instead of the English word God. May we have the question from the sister's side, please? Assalamu alaikum. My name is Danis. I'm studying for BDS. Brother, isn't it said that during days of Prophet, Aisha radiallahu anha used to deliver speeches to the Sahabis. So isn't it important that women scholars today should also make use of media like television in Dawa, provided they are in hijab? This was asked a very good question. And she quoted a reference that Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. She used to give speeches to the Sahabas and she has said to have taught no less than 88 different scholars. She was a scholar of scholar and only on her authority there are 2,210 ahadith narrated and I do agree with that. But sister, the reason was Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. She was the wife of beloved prophet and she was close to the prophet and she had memorized various ahadith which no one in the Muslim Ummah at that time knew. So she was the scholar of the scholar. She had the maximum knowledge. So if you have an option to go to a lady who has maximum knowledge as compared to a gent which has no knowledge at all, then going to a lady is allowed. So today also if a situation arises where you have a Muslim, a Muslim woman who is excellent in knowledge, then if a group of men want to go to her for knowledge, they can go. But even when Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, when she gave, she maintained a hijab. Many a time it was through a curtain, not face to face. It was through a curtain that they used to give because the wife of the Prophet had to maintain extra hijab. And the main point was because she was the human being who had one of the highest knowledge. She had certain knowledge which none of the Sahabi had. So in this situation, but natural, even today you can speak to a woman, not that you can't speak, you can get trained on a woman, but if you know that there is a man who has more knowledge than a woman, so the men should prefer to go to the men and the woman to a woman. Similarly, if a woman wants to gain knowledge and if there's no other woman who has equal knowledge as that of a man, then she can go to a man to get knowledge. But if you tell me that a man in this world today has more knowledge than a woman and yet to go to a woman, then that doesn't serve the purpose. It's unnecessary breaking the hijab. But even if you have to go to women, you can go, but it is within the purview of Islam that the Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, she used to speak very often in the curtain. So now, so if that situation arises, sister, very well, the women can give knowledge if they feel they are the best in the world and no one has equivalent knowledge to them in that field of fiqh or field of Islam, they can give, maintain the Islamic hijab. Hope that answers the question. There's an non-Muslim brother by the name of Jagdish who makes a reference to one of Dr. Zakir Naik's talks yesterday. His question is, Brother Jagdish would like to know, if prophets were sent to every nation of the world, 
then which prophets were sent to India? Can Ram, Krishna, etc. be considered prophets of God? And his second but related question is, if several revelations were sent by God before the Quran, can we consider the Vedas or the Bhagavad Gita, etc. as the word of God? The question posed was that if prophets were sent to each and every nation, as the Quran says in Surah Fatih, chapter 35, verse 24, there is not a nation or a tribe to whom we have not sent a warning or a guide. The Quran says in Surah Raj, chapter 13, verse number 7, Wali Kulli in Had, and to every nation have we sent a guide. Prophets were sent to each and every nation. So the question posed was that which prophets were sent to India? Can we consider Ram as prophet of God, as Krishna prophet of God? And which revelation was sent to India? Can we consider Veda to be the word of God or Bhagavad Gita to be the word of God? Brother, by name, there are 25 messengers mentioned in the glorious Quran, like Adam, Noah, Abraham, Ismail, Ishaq, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. 25 by name. So whichever the Quran mentions, we can say for sure they were prophets of Almighty God. But which are not mentioned in the Quran, what we can say, maybe. There are some politicians, Muslim politicians, who say that Ram alayhi salam, Ram may peace be upon him, as though he is a prophet of God. They scratch the back of the non-Muslims so that they in turn scratch their back. See, what I say, that Quran doesn't mention Ram or the prophet of God. Quran doesn't say Krishna is the prophet of God. What I say, that maybe they were. But even if they were messengers of God, what we have to realize is that all the messengers that came, all the prophets that came before the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they were only sent for their group of people and the message was meant for a particular time period. So even if Ram was a messenger of God, I'm not saying he is, even if he was, hypothetically, taken for granted he was, even if he was, today the Indians should not follow Ram or Krishna. Because if he was a prophet, he was only meant for that time and for those people. Today you have to follow the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who was not sent only for the Muslim or the Arab, but the Quran says in Surah Al-Anbiya, chapter 21, verse number 107, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ الْعَالَمِينَ They have sent thee not but as a mercy to the whole of humanity, as a mercy to all the creatures. The Quran says in Surah Sabah, chapter 34, verse 28, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا قَافَةَ لِلنَّاسِ بَشِيرَ وَنَذِيرُ that we have sent thee not but as a universal messenger, giving glad tidings and warning them against sin. But most of the human beings, they do not know. So even if Ram was a messenger, even if Lakshman was a messenger, even if Krishna was a messenger, he was meant for those people for that time. Even if he was, today all the people in the world, whether in India, America, Europe, Arab countries, they should follow the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Similarly, the name of four revelations are given in the Holy Quran. The Torah, the Zabur, the Injil, and the Quran. Whether Veda is the word of God, whether Bhagavad Gita is the word of God, since they are not mentioned by name, I cannot say for sure they are word of God. Quran says there were revelations sent to various people, various revelations. Name of all have not been mentioned. So what I say, Bhagavad Gita may be the word of God. Ramayana may have been the word of God. Veda may have been the word of God. I cannot say for sure. But even if they were the word of God, since all the revelations that came before the glorious Quran, they were only meant for their people as they were meant for a particular time period. Therefore, the Quran says that since it was not meant for eternity, Allah didn't think it fit to preserve these revelations. And the glorious Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 79, it says, فَوَيْلُلْ لِلَّذِينَ يَقْتُبُونَ الْكِتَابَ بِعَيْدِهِمْ سُمَّا يَقُلُونَ هَذَا مِنْ إِنْدِ اللَّهِ لِيَشْتُرُ بِهِ ثَمْنٍ كَلِيلًا that woe to those who write the book with their own hands and then say this is from Allah. To traffic with it for a miserable price. Woe to those for what they hand to write, woe to those for what they earn. That means all the revelations that came before the Quran, since they were meant only for a particular group of people, they were not meant for eternity, Allah didn't think it fit to preserve it. Therefore they have been changed. So even if Veda were the word of God, today they are not in the authentic form. Bhagavad Gita is not maintained in the original form. Besides the Quran, all the religious scriptures have been distorted. And since Quran is not meant only for the Muslims, not meant only for the Arabs, the Quran says in Surah Ibrahim, chapter 14, verse 52, that here is a message for the whole of humankind. Let them take warning therefrom. Let them know there is only one God. Let the men of understanding take heed. 
Quran says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 185, Ramadan was the month in which the Quran was revealed as a guide to the humanity, as a criteria to judge right from wrong. Quran says in Surah Al-Zumur chapter 39 verse 41, that we have revealed to thee that Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, the book to instruct mankind. It doesn't say to instruct the Arabs or the Muslims, but to instruct the whole of humankind. So Quran is a revelation which is meant till eternity and for the whole of humankind. Even if Veda was the word of God, even if Bhagavad Gita was the word of God, today it has not maintained its original form. Quran says in Surah Hijar chapter 15 verse number 9, Allah will guard it from corruption. It's an uncorrupted book. So even if Veda was the word of God, it has been changed. Even if it hasn't been changed, if some people say, it was only meant for those people and for that time. Today, all the people in the world, whether they're living in India or America, or Europe, they should follow the last and final revelation, the glorious Quran. Question from the Gen side. Assalamu alaikum. Brother Zakir Naik, my question is you give a shocking account of the pathetic conditions of Muslims, especially of Muslims of India, I think that uh, they are lagging far behind in media generally, especially in mass media, so on and so forth. They lag far behind in journalism, etc., etc. These are all the symptoms of a disease. That means one cannot be an enemy of himself. A community cannot be the enemy of itself. When the community is lagging behind in each and every aspect, to the extent that a small offshoot of the same community, that Qadianism, they, you say they are doing well. So will you be able to give the exact reason why Muslims are lagging behind in all this field? Well, ask the question that why are Muslims lagging behind when we know that it's a particular condition, that in media we're lacking behind, in journalism, in science and technology, why we're lacking behind? Do you know, brother, at a time we were on the top? From the 8th to the 12th centuries, it was called as the Dark Ages. As the Dark Ages. Dark for whom? Dark for the Europeans. The media today projects from the 8th to 12th century Dark Ages. Who's projecting? The media. The media. It was dark for the Europeans. They were backward. The world was not backward. The world with the limited knowledge that the Arab Muslims had, the amount of advances they made, it's tremendous. You know, there were Muslim scientists who were far advanced from the 8th to 12th century. If you know the scientific history, that Muslims were far advanced in several fields. In several, the first person who discovered the blood circulation was Ibn Nafis, 600 years after the revolution of the Quran. But today we know of William Harvey. William Harvey described blood circulation 400 years after Ibn Nafis. But no one knows about Ibn Nafis, everyone knows about William Harvey. Media is in their hands. Then further, the first person who drew the world map was the Arab, Ali Drusi, in 1154. Mathematics, Muslims were far advanced. The zero was learned from the Indians. The Arabs introduced zero and the decimal point to the world. In trigonometry, Muslims were far advanced. If you know Al-Biruni, he was expert in trigonometry and maths. We learn about the Pythagoras theorem in school, that the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the square of the other two sides, Pythagoras theorem. Who, who discovered it? A Muslim, al abtusi a Muslim, he discovered it. We know about Pythagoras theorem, we don't know about al -Abtusi. We are to blame. The media is in their hands. If you know al Kindi, he was expert in physics, in mathematics. He first said that all laws aren't absolute, they are relative. All physical laws aren't absolute. Newton, Galileo, all of them said all physical laws are absolute. al Kindi said no, they are relative. It was Albert Einstein who later on did more research and propounded the theory of relativity. We know about Albert Einstein, no one knows about al Kindi. Shakir, Muhammad, and Ahmad, these three brothers, they gave the surface area of the earth by measuring angle at the Red Sea, when people thought the world was flat. The person who first distilled alcohol, we learn in school, Gebar, Gebar. What is Gebar? He's Jabir, Jabir ibn Hayyan. They even Latinized the name so that we don't come to know he's a Muslim. You know, Gebar sounds like a Westerner, Gebar. Jabir. If we say Jabir, we know it's a Muslim. When we say Gebar, a Westerner. Jabir ibn Hayyan was expert in the field of chemistry. He distilled alcohol, and the word alcohol comes from the word algul, meaning an evil spirit. We learn in a school, Geber, Geber, Jabir. 2,000 works he wrote only on chemistry. 
Ali ibn Abbas, expert in the field of uh, medicine. If you know about uh, Muhammad Zakaria Razi, he was expert. He spoke about measles and smallpox. The findings of his was tremendous. We know Avicenna, Avicenna. Who's Avicenna? Ali ibn Sina, Avicenna. Avicenna sounds like a Westerner. Ali ibn Sina. He's known as the Aristotle of the East. So the media is in their hands. The Muslims were tremendous. They were powerful. We were on the top. We were the torch bearers. Why? Because we were close to the Quran and the Sunnah. Today, Muslims are going to the dogs, I'm saying. Dogs. You know why? We are backward. Why? Because we are going away from our religion. The reason the Westerners are advancing is because they too are going away from the religion. The next question is, uh, Mr. Atul Menon is keen on knowing why do Muslims have non-veg food? Killing an animal is a ruthless, merciless act. Why do Muslims have non-veg food? The question posed was that why do Muslims have non-veg food? Killing animal is ruthless, why don't take life, etc. You should be vegetarian. And these many of our non-Muslim friends in India, especially the Hindus and Jain, they tell us. If you analyze the set of teeth of the herbivorous animals, like the cow, the goat, the sheep, they have got flat teeth. They only eat vegetables. If you analyze the set of teeth of the carnivorous animal, lion, tiger, leopard, they have got pointed set of teeth. Point set of teeth. But if you analyze the set of teeth of the human beings, we have flat teeth as well as pointed teeth. Herbivorous teeth as well as carnivorous teeth. We have an omnivorous set of teeth. If Almighty God wanted us to have only vegetables, why did he give us this pointed teeth? Why? He wanted us to have both. Where is that non-veg? Again, the digestive system of the cow can only digest vegetables. It can't digest non-veg. The digestive system of the carnivorous animal, lion, tiger, leopard, can only digest non-veg, can't digest vegetables. The digestive system of the human being can digest both non-veg and veg. If Almighty God wanted us to have only vegetables, why did he give us a digestive system which can digest both veg and non-veg? And further, if you analyze that most of the religious scripture, whether it's Bible or Veda or Raman, they give permission to have non-veg. If you read the Hindu scriptures, the sages and sons, they had non-veg. They even ate beef. Now, there are some of the people who argue, I think, that if you analyze, the Hindu scriptures give permission. But the reason why they even became vegetarian is because they were being influenced by other philosophies like Jainism, etc., which believed in Ahimsa. Now, if you argue with the Jain and you argue with these Hindus now who have given up non-veg, some of them, when you ask them, why should we not have non-veg, so they will tell you, non-veg is killing living creatures. If you kill living creatures, bad. Therefore, you should have only plants. Today, science has advanced and we have come to know that even plants are living creatures. Previously, people thought plants have no life. But today, we have come to know even plants are living creatures. They have life. So the argument has changed. Yes, brothers, Arkad, we know that plants have life. But you know, plants can't feel pain. Therefore, killing a plant is less a sin as compared to killing an animal. Today, science has further advanced and we have come to know even the plants can feel pain. They can even cry. They even feel happy. Do you know that? Research is shown to us today that the plants even feel happy. They can even cry. They feel pain. But the thing is, you cannot hear their cry. Because the human frequency is from 20 cycles per second to 20,000 cycles per second. Anything below and above this, you can't hear. You know silent dog whistle? The dog can hear till 40,000 cycles per second. So the silent dog whistle is the frequency above 20,000 cycles per second so that the human beings can't hear, but below 40,000 cycles per second so that the dog can hear. So when the master whistles, the dog comes running, but human beings can't hear. So similarly, when the cry given out by the plant, the human beings can't hear because it is not within the range of the human hearing. But even the plants, they cry. There was a non-Muslim who had the maximum argument with me. He said, OK, brother, I agree with you. Plants have got life. Plants can feel pain. But you know, plants have got lesser senses. They have got two or three senses. Animal has got five senses. Therefore, killing animal is a bigger crime. So I said, I agree with you. For sake of argument, I agree with you that plants have got lesser senses. Animal have got more senses. But I ask you a question that suppose your brother, he is born deaf and dumb, two senses less, deaf and dumb. When he grows up, afterwards, someone comes and kills him. So will you go and tell the judge, oh, me Lord, 
give the murderer less punishment because my brother had two senses left. He was dumb and he was deaf. In fact, you will tell him, Usne to masum ko maar hai. he has killed an innocent person. You should give him double punishment. In Islam, the Quran gives permission that you can have meat. Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 1, you can have the meat of the cattle, of the animal, four-footed animal, with the exception name. Quran further says in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse number 5, that of the meat you can eat. Quran says in Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse 21, that in the cattle is an instructive sign for you. We give you milk to drink from the bodies, and in them are various benefits of the meat you can eat. So very well, because Quran says you can have the good things that we have provided, there's no problem at all in having non-veg. Hope that answers the question. There is a related question asked by another non-Muslim brother. Brother Giriraj would like to know, science tells us that whatever you eat has an effect on your behavior. Why does Islam allow Muslims to eat non-veg food? Because eating of animals makes a person violent and ferocious. Please explain. The brother asked a question that whatever you eat has an effect on a behavior, and I do agree with that's a scientific explanation. Whatever you have has an effect on a behavior. So why do you all have non veg? Because you are non veg, you all are ferocious people, you know, all violent, fighting and terrorism and attacking. What you all eat has an effect on a behavior, and I do agree, science says. That what you eat, it has certain things, certain times it has an effect on a the behavior. Therefore, the Quran says in Surah Araf, chapter 7, verse number 157. It says that the Prophet has allowed you things which are good and has prohibited you from having things which are bad. He's made for you permissible things which are benefit for you and has prohibited you from having things which are wrong for you. That's the reason in Islam, the Prophet said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, you are not allowed to have the meat of the carnivorous animal like tiger, leopard, cat, etc. We are only allowed to have the meat of the herbivorous animal. You know, carnivorous animals, they are ferocious. We have meat of the herbivorous animal, like cow, goat, sheep. So we have to behave, you know, as mild and as soft, like the cow, like the goat, like the sheep. So whatever you eat has an effect on the behavior. We eat cow, beef, meat of the sheep and goat, which are herbivorous animal, you know, domestic animal, loving animal. We are not allowed to have meat of the canine animal, like, you know, tiger, lion, leopard, neither of the rodents like rats and reptiles, a prophet sent Sayyid Bukhari, neither birds of prey like falcons, vultures, etc. So these are prophet prohibited, therefore we are kind and peace-loving people. Thank you, Dr. Zakir Naik. The question and answer session is over. Now I would like to ask our chairman, Mr. Saduddin Sali, to give a briefing. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Salat wa Salam wa Rasul Kareem. Dr. Zakir Naik, brothers and sisters, I thank Almighty Allah for having given me this opportunity to be with you and also to hear the scholarly vocabulary of Dr. Zakir Naik. He is an asset to the community and not only to our community but to the mankind as a whole. We want such Zakir Naiks in many more numbers to discuss, not only give a speech, to discuss the questions which are coming like firing stones from the audience, and he can explain it better, thereby thwarting the disbelief and misunderstanding in our community as well as inter-communities. So I pray Almighty Allah to grant him strength and long life, and also congratulate his Islamic Research Foundation, who are in this human service. Thank you, one and all. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum.